So small group today, not too bad. So we'll make the most of what we have. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started, everybody. Again, this is our fourth and final meeting of the year. Before we kind of get into the actual agenda itself, um, we're going to kind of have an open forum for the beginning of the meeting and allow Ms. Gonzalez here, who's one of our parents, to speak on a topic that she would like for us to hear about. You may oh. do whatever. Stand, sit, how are you like? <laughs> okay, um, I'm here. Well, thank you for allowing me to speak here in front of you. Um, I'm just here to address some concerns that I have that which actually arose um, from an incident that occurred at the high school. Um, my son was accused of being under the influence due to a insufficient <coughs> drug analysis that was performed on him. Um, when I asked the, the nurse what specialized training she had, the only training that she gave me was an entry assessment that she performed in front of the police officers and nothing further. <coughs> I don't know how long she's been employed there, um, but no other training has been conducted since then. And, sh and I feel as if somebody put in that position to make that determination should be more skillful than just that. Um, I did take my son to get a third party test, which came back negative. Um, Ms. Vega and I reviewed video. Uh, he was actually accused of being, of smoking in the restroom. For some reason, before I received a phone call and any other um, investigation went forward, they didn't review the, the videos. I reviewed the videos. My son never set foot in a restroom. Um, this test, I have spoken with a head nurse at a different um, district, and she informed me that their testing is more thorough than what this one actually is, and it's not a testing. I've spoken here at the administration with other administrators who informed me, of course, this is not a test. When I received the call, I was informed that my son tested positive or being under the influence. Those words I've never expected to hear, especially from administration at, uh, administrator at school. I became highly upset at my son. But when I came here, I saw the paper that was laid out in front of me, and I knew there was no way. I knew there was no way that my son did this. I heard everything he had to say. He immediately said that he was not present during that incident with the children involved. And um, so it all resulted to him not being there, not being under the influence. The test that I, uh, the third party test I received showed negative for, he didn't smoke that day, the week before, sec, you know, two weeks before that, a month before that. He did, and in all of this, he was about to be put in a disciplinary program which he had nothing to do with. And it affected him, it affected me. I've missed school, I've, I've missed work to come here to prove my point that my son was not, he, he didn't do what he was accused of. So um, I was recommended to look at this blog site from other school nurses that mention that so many blogs state that these school nurses, and they're saying it themselves, that these school nurses have no idea what they're looking for. Um, the head nurse that I spoke with <clears throat> says the same thing. Um, it's, it's not a sufficient form. It's up to the school district to put further steps in place or further things on the form. Um, odor is one big factor in somebody being under the influence because, I mean, that's highly, you know, you, you can tell right off the bat if you can smell. My son had told them to smell his clothes, smell his breath, smell, and they refused. Um, things that are important on that checklist is the vitals. My son had a 67 heart rate, which anybody knows if somebody's under the influence, their heart rate is going to be elevated. It's going to be high. With the normal heart rate, that is something that she is very familiar with, and she could have stated that it, it, it doesn't, um, 
it's not consistent with someone being under the influence and she failed to do that. Um, a, a lot of ways this form has failed my son and without knowing how many other students it has failed, just knowing that it failed one should be enough to change that form. And more, more assess, more has to be on there. Um, some nurses stated that um, the child's quotes, what his statement or their statement is actually written down on this form. Nowhere on the form does it have odor. Nowhere on the form does it have child's quotes or child's statement and put down because once they deny it, it's not the administrator's right to continue to antagonize a student. You know, um, if you feel that he's under the influence uh, and this assessment may show, you immediately ask the parent to conduct a third party test. You do not accuse the student of being under the influence. You, the, the nurse can't even confirm this. Why would I get a phone call saying that my son failed a drug test? That it's, it's just, and I could leave it alone since, you know, I provided all the evidence. I had to do my own investigation. I had to do, um, uh, call the administrators and, and request several meetings before all this was taken care of. Um, he's now gonna stay in school. You know, he, he, he was nearly stripped from his daily school activities, from his peers to put in a disciplinary action. And to me, that's just labeling him as a troubled child. I mean, that's what I would think of, you know, a child is going to disciplinary program. What did he do? My son did nothing wrong. So um, I'm just hoping that you guys, um, I mean, you, I know I, I was told that this is the place to be to make, hopefully, um, make have some changes made. And I hope that you guys can get this assessment, you know, up to par with, you know, students that I'm not, I'm sure he's not the only one that has gone through this. And I hopefully, I hope he'll be the last because it's, it's tough. It's tough. You know, I, it was tough on me to hear that. And it was tough on him. Like I told all the administrators that I spoke with, my son loves this school district. And, you know, he, it, it, it just, it was stressful. And it was right before these, these uh, tests. And I did not appreciate it at all. I did not appreciate to get that phone call. And I didn't appreciate my son almost. He, you know, if I wouldn't have taken it upon myself, and who knows how many parents had, you know, didn't feel that they should do that or what, whatever the reason would be, my son would have been taken to, you know, he would have been stripped from these things that he loves. So thank you very much, and I hope that, you know, you guys can make some changes on that form. And hopefully, you know, also nurses need more training than what they do. There is a class that uh, is held for school nurses to get more uh, familiar with these types of things. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to step out. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you for your time. Yes, thank you. What's the form look like? Um, it gives, uh, it says under the influence. Uh, I don't know if it says test or assessment, but it has under the influence. I think it, all the campuses have, have them the same, I believe. Um, and it has the vitals, and it has a space for abnormal or normal. Um, and then comments, and then it has just some notes, space for notes, and so what they usually do is, but but she's not wrong, there are, there's leeway, like, it's up to the nurse to ask some questions, so they'll ask them questions, like, do you know what day it is, do you know what month it is, do you know, um, you know where you're at, and just to kind of um, go through, they, they usually look at the eyes and they write down notes, like if it's red, glossy eyes, or not, um, slurred speech, shaky, but it's kind of let that part is left up to them to ask. Those it's it's blank, it's yeah. blank right there, and then it has their vitals, which is not blank. But a lot of times, I will say, in my experience, they will put the and you know, if you know what vital signs are supposed to be like, 
then you can kind of read and do it yourself. But it, it has a space for normal, abnormal, high, low, blah, uh, for some kind of specificity. And sometimes the nurses will go through them and not put one or the other. Um, I mean, maybe even a, like some kind of, like the, when she said that he had failed a test, I mean, uh, well, I think getting a call Well, this is just more a, information. And yeah, yeah that maybe the, the wording. The wording. Was was to say, you know, These, those are the three things I picked up on right there yeah. after hearing her talk. Right. We, we use that at the middle school, but if even if the nurse is like, they, they really appear to be on something, we call parent. But to go to DAEP, that we pretty much have to see it, catch them with it on them, or get a confession in order to go to that measure. I just would hate to send. You don't send them for a test, though? If they're showing Do signs <clears throat> of. Do where where would we send them? So that's, oh, that's what our. I don't know. I've never. That's no, no, the, these, are good, these are good questions. Keep them That's a good line. conversation because this is, is what happens. And that's. And it we should definitely all be on the same page with how we handle this because at any point we could have, even at the intermediate campus, right? Yeah, and I don't think we, have we to, are. We have to be consistent with our procedures across the board. And if we have issues with our form, our form has, you know, it's to be desired that there's additional things or comments or areas so that we can capture more data or just capture more of the, the context behind what's happening. Just objectivity, I think. And, yeah, and, and removing the objectivity right. behind it so it's complete, I mean, not subjective in the sense that we get to pick and choose what we're going to do, but a, a complete objective form that allows you to make determinations based on the facts and the evidence you have. I think that was the end. intent, yeah. but then... It Gotta turns be careful in, with that one, though. Yeah, I think that was the intent when, when they built that form. Oh, I see what created. you're saying. Okay. I think that was the intent um, with, the, with the form to kind of say um, it's not yes or no, but it's like facts. So yeah. you, but unless you are, unless you're familiar with what the heart rate should look like, and, you know, honestly, um, without just that's, the that's title bringing a kid into my office, well, their heart rate's going to go up. Yeah. Their hands are going to get sweaty. They're going to shake. It depends on what they're using because nowadays the chemicals change all the time. It's hard to there, be like... Well, and that's the other so thing. We had a pretty wild to evaluation, say, and we call parents. You know, we're concerned about their health. Uh, get to visiting with them. Well, they're on some allergy medications, and they're having problems with allergies. We go back to the nurse. She said nystagmus could be contributed to by this. Heart rate could be contributed to by that particular medication, and we came to the conclusion that they're just on allergy medication. At my last school, they were we had a they had a statement that something something to the effect of uh, they're showing uh, signs or symptoms consistent with some form of uh, oh, some form of inhibitor or something mm -hmm. like that. Is there anything that's changed at home? So it's 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 more of like that. Not you fail a test, mm -hmm. but we're seeing some we're signs concerned. and symptoms. Yeah. 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 Because and of this. The big thing I picked up on first was the test versus evaluation. Evaluation is simply what we're talking about, right? A test is literally putting somebody through a process to make a determination based on what we find. If we're evaluating, we can, we can call and say, here's, here's what we have discovered. Here's, here are the concerns, right? But if we're doing a test... And if it comes back yes or no, then yeah, that's totally separate from just making an evaluation. So I thought that was a big thing. So if, we're, if a nurse or someone's calling to say, yeah, your son tested, whoa, 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 whoa. Oh. Not sure if that's the right word. And I think maybe that was part of the, that was the, the, the misstep we took yes. with that was she definitely picked up on that. And that's a trigger, right? Because test versus evaluation gives off two totally different contexts. So if we didn't even test, but we're using that word, we're already sending the wrong message. So hopefully that can be something we take away as an experience to say, making sure that while we provide better nurse training on this, that we talk about why we don't say this term and we use this term, because this is actually what we're doing, right? I'm also saying based on my observation. Right, and, and using the correct terms that provide the real context behind what we're doing rather than maybe providing... Uh, I don't know, a miscommunication that's giving this person, this parent, a different idea about what actually happened or what maybe happened from her perspective, but what actually happened was we performed an evaluation. We're just not really capturing it that way. Because we don't test kids. 
We're, right. we're, we don't we don't have a drug well, test. Well, that's that we, what I told her. We're mixing, you know, the pH stuff in the back, like a lab. Like that's not what we do. We don't do anything like that. So we do um, offer them if they if we feel that they were under the influence, and we're going to move forward with a DAEP placement, um, then we start the hearing part yeah. of it, which is where I took over that part of it. So she came in, we did review the video footage, but I did tell her, well, that's not the only thing, of course, that we consider. So at the end of it all, we were moving forward with the AEP placement and offered her um, to do a third party test if she wanted to and bring that in if he was to test from that, if it was to show that he wasn't. I also um, think those are faulty because the, between the chemical changes and the levels that they test, because all labs test different levels working for CPS, ours were much more sensitive to the ones than them getting a third party. So you can go get a third party test and it can still stay negative because but they're it probably cut off give you versus here. Uh, it probably err on the co side of the student in that respect, right? I mean, it's like um, if you get a false negative, you'd get a that's false, good for the student. You'd get a false negative more than you would get a false positive. Which is, if they if they bring us that, we can take that because it's still better than what we did. Um, so what but training is out there for our nurses for that? Because that, I mean, that's I don't know. I'm not familiar with. The and that's the thing we have, and that's what I, I told mom. I don't mom. think there's really anything we could do on the spot that would be yeah. a certainty. And so, mm -hmm. like I say, I think from that evaluation, you go with concern, uh, you know, and if you have something else to support that belief. You know, maybe move forward, but not just with evaluation. Is this evaluation a, a house or a standardized? It's ours. Is it? There's a, yeah, there's it's a ours. I don't know who created it, but it was created a long time ago, and we have we used it for many, many years. Need to look at it. And by mine, we definitely need to look at it. I think it would. Uh, it would be nice to have a little bit more, and I don't mean yes under the influence or no, but. Um, something that is a little bit more um, substantial. Mm -hmm. I would say if they have this criteria, this criteria, and this criteria, then we have concerns enough to send them to And the very agency. specific, and then with a rubric of how we determine or how we substantiate, they are possibly, if there's no other I in issues involved, for example, if they don't take medication, if they don't well, have an issue. That should be on there. So, you should know that maybe perhaps... There is some um, I mean, regardless. That. Are we going to send the kid to DAP just based on some, um, some vitals? If are they're we high, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's where we differ. Okay, so yeah, I'm just going to tell you, like, high school is, they're very savvy, and they're very high. Like, I may not be able to tell you, um, I mean, they can sit there and they can know the name of the date, the time, the street, the president. They might, they might not. Um, but... But I think that the high schoolers are a little bit more savvy about doubt, getting I'm caught. That. I mean, for example, They're today, not very savvy at the middle school. Ms. Right. In case you forgot about and, that. And they don't know how to lie as good. I yeah, mean, they I can know. lie, but you can read right through it. And so, that's a little bit um, easier to say, no, their stories are completely inconsistent. They're not... You know, at the high school, they're buying and selling on Cash App. They're dealing in the bathrooms. They're smoking. They're throwing it that under the like the rubric. Though. Under the, the stuff. I mean, they're really they're really pretty savvy. And so, to go, um, we need to actually have it and see it. That's tying our hands way behind our back. If they have red eyes, if they have yeah, I, the form we can probably tweak to where it's. Pretty substantial enough to say you're high. I think the training should not necessarily teach the nurses how to do their job based on that, but like teaching them the wording to use yeah, when they're talking to It's yeah. more going, making sure that we're yeah. checking all of our boxes from a professional and a legal standpoint. Yes. And just so that we're clear on what it is that we should be doing and what we should not be, be doing. doing. And what we That's should That's what say. the training would be and about. In county, we were, we were like, we have reason to believe that they're under the influence of something. And you're we're going to request that you get a third party you know uh, test and that was that's where it was and they said well what if i don't get it well then i'm sorry but we're going to proceed as if they are 
So I like that more because now the choice is on the parent yeah. to take our recommendation based on the observations and the evidence we have. And if they're refusing, well, then we're going to assume that you're, you're accepting our evidence and we're going to move forward and, and do what we need to do administratively. So in these yeah. two cases that we had that were pretty much back to back, that's basically the, that was basically the case. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what we tell them, like, we're moving forward because we believe that this is the case. And, and then they were allowed to bring in. And what what would we say, like, for instance, if we were at that point talking to the parent about our findings and making the recommendation it's that the we word. need you to go get a test because we've got some evidence here that is edging on the confirmation of, you know, being under the influence. Is that like a 24-hour turnaround? Do we have to, you've got to go from here to well, the here's the other four and, and go ahead Here's the other problem with with the parents or that that we're facing so and this is um i think this is everybody like the oss like the out of school suspension mm -hmm. happens pretty much immediately right. for all those mandatory placements um or where we're going to recommend mandatory placements so it's three days of out of school suspension we do investigate during that time and hold meetings and whatnot and we need that time i think but that time is considered punishment and like why are you punishing before you even know well we're not gonna con we're not gonna know we're not gonna know even after we investigate we're not gonna know anything substantially more than we know right now like but we are going to investigate and we don't consider just one thing so like she said we followed him through the building and that took quite a bit of going through every camera but i'm pretty good with the cameras so i kind of maneuvered through his trek and uh, we didn't have a camera where the that one bathroom is so that's what they went with because down the hall there were two other kids with them one pulling out stuff and the other one hi um and and so all of that was used to reasonably believe X, Y, Z. Is so, it okay to show, like, to allow parents to see our cameras and stuff? Like, I thought that when was a it's, violation. Um, when it is not the other students, uh, when it's when it's their student, yes, and um, I try real hard to, like, cover up any other students. If it's their um, disciplinary record, then right. mm -hmm. you don't. So where he was by himself walking. Um, at one point, I saw him with three people. I just kind of pulled the camera to me and just kind of watched it. And um, but I, That's a great question, though, because that gets back to kind of maybe what we were talking about maybe at one point uh, a year or so ago about what can we, what can we not, mm -hmm. and that edges on the whole educational record because if, if, it's, it's, a if it's being used as part of a discipline uh, consequence that becomes part of the educational record, therefore it's private. It's private. Confidential. Confidential. So, so we so can't show it to parents' videos. Yes, we can. We can if it's part of the educational record. But if we it's can not, show it, or if, if we their can't, kid. if we're revealing too much other information about students, like faces and and identities, then we either need to redact or simply say we can't show it because we can't, in confidence, just focus on your student. We've got too much happening here. What I sometimes do is I'll. Um, blow it up a little bit to where it's grainy enough where the other kids aren't really, can't see their faces or their bodies. You can yeah. just see bodies moving. But um, but you can't, and we're going to, like, face a lot more fight in the opposite direction. Like, you know, when you refuse to show the parent when it's all right there. Yeah. Like, I do whatever I can to show it to them, but especially if it's incriminating for their child. It's like, yeah. you, this is why I came up with this. I didn't, I'm not just picking on your kiddo, but I, I've gone even to the extent of putting little stickies on the, on the screen. And showing her just, you know, here's the little one before. minute, 30 seconds. Line. Yeah. Okay, I just need you to focus on this little box right yeah. here as the screen. This is your kid, and here's the pot. <laughs> or here's the. Because you bring up a good point mm -hmm. about transparency and the need to work through transparency because if we're trying to hide or conceal when they're requesting, that to me gives off the perception that we're hiding something because Especially why would we not show them the video when we can look at it, right? So what's the difference between us looking at it and them? 
And obviously, there are some legal things that we need to consider too, but if we're just talking strictly from perception about saying no, you can't see it, that to me is let's try to not have that be the message because then they take the perception as, well, they're hiding You're something. Hiding. Or, what else are you hiding? Yeah. And or what the else cameras are you aren't working. Or about or whatever. That was, I, I, yeah, that was just ignorance on my part. Like, I've always been told, no, you don't show that. I'm yeah. Like, oh, okay, That's because cool. that works in our favor. I guess, oh, well. I <laughs> mean, sometimes the less they... I mean, not here they, necessarily, yeah. but just through the academic... Sometimes, yeah, the less they see, the better, or, you know, it's, it can... It, they can take it the wrong way, but, like, mostly I've gotten more lash backlash when mm -hmm. I just say yes. that camera's down versus come on in let me check if that if I can pull it up knowing that it's not there but just doing it in front of them to show them look that it's really not working let me call and see if it works for the other guy and if it's just mine or if it's the system or if it because we have those cameras that for any Certain thing you need, it's not working on that day or didn't record. But I think that that um, the time that we took with her at the actual meeting, and that's what those meetings are for. When you say uh, so, when you follow the the script, and you say, "I really just want to hear what you have to say," and then she was like, "I want to see like where my kid went into that bathroom." I was like, "Well, we don't have that camera. That camera where he went into that bathroom." is not working, I don't believe, but I'll show you. So I showed her where he walked in. He was late, so he was by himself walking But in. that was part of the decision-making behind uh, the consequence though, right? Yeah, so she... You see how that kind of don't have, can't show you, but we're gonna use what what we know or yeah. what we felt happened. And I really don't think he did go in, not that we need to discuss specifics, but right. to in this case, like you could follow the kid and he didn't walk into the bathroom to the best of my knowledge, but that's not the only thing to consider. Because when you're talking about somebody being high, on, especially on a high school campus, like they're just more free, more savvy. They go around the building, they'll come back around, come inside. <coughs> so they could have gotten high in any number of places, and just because they weren't in that bathroom doesn't mean that they didn't, didn't do it. So there's other things to consider, but I think it really saves us. But really, it's the same as what you were talking about. It's the conversation that you had saying, and and to defend like the people that were doing the investigation that they, there were ten kids caught with for intercession pot and marijuana yeah, yeah. pot and vapes okay. so ten kids were suspended that day it was a lot of craziness a lot of bathroom stuff going on so yeah it was probably would have been better to have more time and say. You know, here's the process. Come in. I'd like to show you the process that we use. And and you can still say the same thing. I believe that he was under the influence. If you want to prove me wrong, go ahead, because it is a big deal. We take it seriously. But this is the tool I have. It's all the tools we use. And this is what we're going to do. And we're going to have his meeting on Monday. So prepare yours. And they had a week, you know, to do it. Um, I guess most cases I dealt with were frequent flyers. You know, it was, it was their parents knew. I mean, it was always very yeah. clear. There was very little evidential stuff that we had other than to say, hey, we believe he's under the influence because of these. we had an officer on campus that would check vitals and the whole thing and have the nurse yeah. work with him. And I really like that our parents, though, like we do have a lot of parents that care. And there are, we're going to run into more of this the more frequent that the vaping becomes. I mean, it's rampant. And Kids that wouldn't normally use are probably using more. Not this child in specifically, but kids that wouldn't are. And now we have like 15 kids in ADC. Only two of them are not for marijuana. Right. You know, I had a kid tell me today, I smoke. I smoke at home after dinner. I like to vape marijuana. My parents vape. Everything's cool. I just don't bring it to school. I was like... Yeah, you do. <laughs> so I'm going to keep my eye on you. You just flushed it down before I got you. But, you know, the more prevalent it becomes, the more we're going to have to tighten up our procedures exactly. and exactly. and the verbiage of what is said. Like, probably couldn't hurt for us to have a... A review? A review of, like, how do you say it? Like, how do you defend that document? Because you do, if that's our tool, 
if that's all we've got, we can't falter on that. That's what we're depending on. But the way we say it, I think, is everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if we can still say that's the tool we use. That's uh, what I believe. And you're welcome to get a third party. What we'll do, I'll recommend that we review our procedures at the next APs meeting. That way we can just get some good collaboration going amongst all the administrators. And hopefully maybe we can make some updates or changes to how we do our business. And, and including the nurses with it. Because I think... Um, I mean, I don't know what you think about, uh, you know, before this whole thing, I always thought, God, I wish they just had a box that said yes or no. <laughs> he's under the influence. In the nurse's opinion, he's under the influence. But that kind of throws a nurse under the bus with what they're providing is just information. They Here's their heart rate. I don't know why, but it's abnormal. Here's their... Blood pressure. That was our nurse. She, would, she would tell you his pupils are dilated, he's unresponsive <coughs> to the stimulus, he's this, that, and the other. And it would never be anything about drugs. Nothing about drugs would come out of her mouth, alcohol, anything right. like that. It yeah. was just, here here's is the vital. Facts. Here's, what, yeah. here's what I determined. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And the odor probably really does need to be on there because I think that is a Oh, that's a clear point. indicator yeah. for sure. Oh, yeah. Smells like axe slash. <laughs> <laughs> Not enough axe. It's always axe by its name. Seventy percent axe. Yeah. Thirty percent flavor of axe smells. <laughs> Weed. Exactly. <laughs> well, that was um, I think the first time that we've had public forum at the um, the shack. So I'm going to kind of just jump down to the uh, bottom of the agenda. And what I'm going to do is kind of just talk amongst our, ourselves here and kind of just get a sense from you guys if, um, if this is something that you guys would like to see added to our bylaws. Because while the SHAC committee acts and functions just like a school board meeting in a lot of ways where it has to be recorded, we have to post the agenda 72 hours in advance. One of the things that our bylaws do not currently contain are rules for public forum, meaning we don't have to necessarily allow it because we don't have it written into our bylaws. That's one distinction between SHAC meetings and school board meetings. So the fact that obviously the request came in to participate in public forum. I wasn't going to deny the parent that opportunity. However, if we're wanting to make that more of a thing to allow a parent to come and air out grievances or to talk about certain topics related to Shaq, are we okay with adding that in and allowing that to be an opportunity to hear from parents or from people about certain things that might have happened or just what's on their mind in general? And we would treat it just like we would with any other school board meeting. Um, the topics would be bound to kind of what's on the agenda. They'd have to sign up in advance so that there would be kind of a protocol to uh, govern all that. Yeah. Are we good with adding that in? Mm -hmm. I think so. Yes. All, all, all yes? Yes. Okay. yes. Yay. 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 <laughs> so what I'll do is I'll make a note and I'll add that in. And one of the things that we'll do for next year... Uh, for next year, when we roll into next school year and we review the bylaws at the beginning of the year, that will be added and we'll kind of just continue on with the review at that time. Okay. Let's see. Going back up. Okay. Terms of service, this is the last meeting. Obviously, our population has dwindled. I know it's the end of the year, everyone's tired. I've already had several people emailing me about why, why they couldn't make it, so I was prepared for a, a small group here. But at the same time, I do want to say I appreciate you guys being here. Um, I don't know if this is everybody's first year or second year. I feel like this is just the second year. Second, second year? Are y'all all first year here? First. Okay. If you're first year? First year. If you're first year, then you have the opportunity to be on the committee again. If you've had two years, then based on the way the rules have been written into the bylaws, like your service is up, and we do appreciate you giving us those two years. But at the same time, if you are a one-year member and are interested in being a year two member, um, I am going to ask that people that are the 
committee application for next year's committees is going to be released uh, next week. And I just ask that you fill it out and make uh, some notes on this. And that way I know kind of what, what, where you are with which committee you're wanting to be a part of. And that can kind of just go from there. The application involves DEIC, which is the other district committee, SHAC, obviously the one we're in now, and then the campus site-based decision-making committee. And so this is just one application for each of the three uh, committees we have, and it just simply takes you through um, information, uh, what's the, your connection to TM, are you currently employed, do you have any children, campus, so forth, have you previously served on a committee? If yes, which one? And then which one interests you? And that's where I'll know your year one status. And uh, just a few quick questions about your interest and what you could possibly bring to the committee that you're wanting to be a part of. And uh, that's pretty much the application. This will be issued out next week. It'll remain open for the month of May. And it'll be... Uh, shared throughout the committee so that any stakeholder group that might be interested has that opportunity to fill out the application and be on the committee. Okay, any questions on that? Uh, Dr. White, so if we've done two years, we can't do it again? That's technically, the rule is you have to allow for others who have not had a chance, but if we have room, we're always going to have you back. So we, so we can apply? Yeah, okay. apply. But then I'll check to say, okay, that's year two. We've got a bunch of year ones, and then we'll just figure out kind of how, how it all shakes out at the end. So there's that. Do you prefer to have that carry over, or would you like new people? It doesn't, I don't have, it, a, I really don't have a preference. Really, it's just making sure that we've got a sizable group to work with, and the people that are wanting to be a part of that committee um, are committed. Um, we get real excited. We want to be a part of stuff, but then when the time comes, and it's like, ah, oh, this meeting's at five, and I'm tired, and it's just I had a long week, and then that's when you start seeing some of the interest, like Wayne. But it's like, but you signed up, you fill out the application, so there are some attendance requirements that will be explained, and it's in the uh, application process that they have to. I've read and understand that if I'm wanting to join. I accept the responsibilities of what it, what it takes to be a member on these committees, which is just simply, please show, show please show up. Yeah. It's pretty simple. Um, one thing I did want to point out is the uh, kind of update to the comprehensive school mental health system. I'm not sure if anybody has seen this, but this is something that was being promoted heavily the last couple months on TEA. And I just wanted to kind of bring everybody back to kind of the big eight components of what TEA is considering the mental health system. It's kind of like from the counselor's world, we have a comprehensive counseling model that has components. And I feel like TA is kind of doing the same now for mental health. And a lot of what you see here as the components, we cover, we do, we train, we have procedures but now it's being captured through the mental health comprehensive system. And so right now, we talked a little bit yesterday at the counselors meeting just about our anti-bullying handbook, our suicide prevention handbook, our procedures for all that, and then some of the next things we'll do for next year to kind of help better support those areas and the stakeholders that are involved in those areas, specifically how we're going to get that information to students and possibly provide some training or some um, one-on-ones or some group meetings so that students understand our expectations. They understand what we do administratively when we receive a call or there's an anonymous tip when it comes to those areas and what they can do to help prevent or help not be part of the problem or just simply be aware that these are things that we do. So if you're thinking of doing this, you understand the consequences and understand the procedures that are going to follow. Um, I don't know how much we currently do of that on the campuses, but I'm really wanting to kind of make that more of a thing that we do for next year. Just because of, I would say from my perspective, I feel like at least on any given week, there's at least three to five incidents or situations that are brought to my attention involving any one of those areas right there. Especially the last one. And it's either really honestly 
suicide, something to do with suicide ideation or prevention or bullying. And I'll say this, as I said yesterday at the counselors meeting, um, TA is definitely monitoring the bullying uh, incidents and how each school district is uh, processing those incidents and reporting and documenting all that. Um, I will ask, is everybody aware of the updated minimum standards for bullying from TA? And how there are actually, from TA's standpoint, official standards that all districts are now held to that also are being backed by the policies that were already in place? Are we aware of any of that? Not thoroughly, but yeah. You know, the forms you sent us. Yeah. Yes, they are. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But um, I'll just kind of pull it up once more. And it's got an entire page dedicated to it. Uh, let's see, where is the actual? Are the forms that we use up to date with that? Yes. Okay. Because. I mean, it, I feel like it covers all of that. It but. does. Um, the big thing I want to share with this uh, updated um, standards from TA is the need to have a committee. We actually have to have a bullying committee, which is comprised of students. And as I said at the counselors meeting, I pitched this to the principals at our principals and directors meeting to ask them, how would we like to incorporate the student stakeholder group? Do we want to actually have an additional committee that's specifically for bullying so that we're in compliance with the new standard? Or do we want to maybe add the student stakeholder group to the site-based committee and allow that group to participate through that committee when it comes to things that deal with bullying or things that will help keep us in compliance with some of these new standards. So kind of meeting at the same time as the SBDM? Right, or calling in that stakeholder group for things that have to do with bullying or just to make sure that we're staying in compliance. Um, the principals didn't seem to really like adding the student group to the site-based committee they seem to be more interested in developing a separate committee for that. And so that's kind of where I'm going with it, is to have a separate committee for, for this and possibly for other things related to mental health. How do we feel about that? I think that um, students will probably be more likely to participate and give their perspective if it feels less like an adult group, mm -hmm. adult-run group. I think they need to have a little autonomy, of course, with some good adult supervision because we don't want... They can do a group like um, the peers, um, the mentorship that they were doing for the middle school, like those kids. Like pals? Yeah, the pals. Big Probably. pals, little pals. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm thinking right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like a student-led group. So. There, there's the policy for, like for what for we're talking about. It's number three. It says it requires each LEA campus to establish a committee which must include parents and secondary level students and may be incorporated into an existing committee that otherwise meets the requirements of these minimum standards to address bullying by focusing on prevention efforts and health and wellness initiatives. That's where I was coming from where we could incorporate that into the site base since we already have that committee established. But like I said, the principals really seem to want to have a separate committee <clears throat> which is fine. It's just, <clears throat> as a former principal myself, I just would see that as another thing I have to manage because now you've got another committee that you've got to have minimum meetings and minimum agenda topics. Would yeah. incorporate into, like, student council or something? Same. It couldn't work that way yeah, no, no. because that that isn't really a committee. It's more of a student group. But no. with the big pals, because they're already kind of helping kids at risk, I think there will be more helpful to give you ideas uh, because they are helping kids with, you know, hyper or, or emotional issues to give you ideas how to treat those kids or how to incorporate or how to talk to them. Mm -hmm. I think that will be the, because they're already working on right. their own, just guided by a teacher. And again, they can do the, the committee with them. 
Okay. Yeah. But either way, it must include parents? Yeah, it's got yeah. to. Based on the, the way TA's written it, yes. And so, like, say a situation pops up, you're going to have a special SBDM meeting in that scenario? That's kind of how I was looking at it, at least to see how it would Otherwise, go. Otherwise, you may have to wait a yeah. month or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Uh, no, to me, it would kind of simplify the process to include an SBDM. That's kind of where I, re when I first read that, I was like, oh, that seems like an opportunity to incorporate just that stakeholder group into the SBDM yeah. mm -hmm. and still stay in compliance and, and, with the new standard. And then I see benefits of students being on that committee <laughs> outside of bullying. Mm -hmm. I am so happy that you said that because that's really what I was hoping to hear from the principals was say, wow, like this helps us get into yeah. compliance with the standard, but maybe if we did have the students added to the SBDM, maybe we could get some further insight from that stakeholder group yeah. on topics that we tend to talk about in that committee yearly, right? Yeah. And SBDM already has parents included. So. If it is, yeah, so it already has the parents, it already has the teachers, yeah, yeah. SBDM and they already have already. their meeting. What we could do is, instead of incorporating them every time, they could meet in the room next door and have their leader. And so they can discuss topics that are relevant and then pull them in yeah. uh, only for the, the things that are that, relatable. Because yeah. not everything in the SBDM would be appropriate for kids to, yes. to be there for. And I think that That's maybe if it's presented them. like that, mm -hmm. like. Because I, if I'm thinking like a principal in like an SBDM meeting, I don't need my kids hearing all of that and being... Um, but two, you could have it where when you develop the agenda, mm -hmm. they are the topics that involve the students are first. first and, and then, then the when parents, that's done, yeah. Yeah. have a great rest of your afternoon, yeah. and then we continue the business yeah. as yeah. usual. Yeah. Or if there's topics that the whole thing's uh, very adult or whatever, yeah. then they can be in another room. I'm yeah. interested in hoping to make this as streamlined and simplified as, as possible. I don't want this scene being seen as, oh, here's another one more thing where now we have to have another committee. Yeah, Wednesday and Thursday. Yeah, <laughs> say, and now we have another night that's going to be taken up where, you know, our nights are very valuable because there's always something going on. It seems like that would be the way to go. Yeah. And something to, get to the think most, about. No, no decisions made yet, but... You're pulling in about. parents, well, like, several days. Pretty much. Yeah, well, you know, they met at the same time and presented spot. at the end instead of at the beginning. I thought I was giving them an easy way out. Stuff but, themselves and but, then go at the you know, end and be like, this is our presentation. You need a horse of water sometimes. Yeah. I think so. But we're going to revisit it again, and hopefully maybe they've had some time to think about it in a different way so that what I just said about maybe having them at the beginning or yeah. their time is here, and then yeah. when it's up, they leave, and then that way you can kind of kill two birds with one stone through one committee, which in my eyes is much easier to manage than having two committees where mm -hmm. that's just one more thing, right? Yeah. Which we easy. always don't want. So start asking them who wants to volunteer for that second committee. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, you already know I'm the involvement principal. Like, well, I'm just going to give one of my EPs to, to manage that. I'm like, <laughs> so lucky you guys, right? And that's also why I'm asking you guys, too, so that you're aware of what's been discussed with them. And so if there's... When we bring this topic back up in May, because I'm gonna make we're gonna make that decision at that time. Hopefully by then we've had conversations or the ability to talk a little bit about this, so that again we're all on the same page with making this the most streamlined and most efficient way of uh, of doing business with the committees. Because I'll I'll say I I manage the shack and I manage the DIC. It's a lot. Yeah. Because I got lots of requirements I have to be able to stay in compliance with. Um, and it's it can be challenging because, I mean, I'll just say this: that's not my only job. That's like one little piece of what I do, and that's just like a principal. It's just one little piece, right, Miss Vega? Yeah, that's right. The next thing I want to just make sure everybody's aware of that every year TA um, requires each school district to fill out a school health survey. Last year, that was done by uh, Patrick Hernandez as he was the lead on Shack. This year it's me, and so I will be responsible for filling out this survey. It will be due on Friday, June 2nd. And so, um, like I said, starting next month, I will be going through and answering these questions. And so I might be reaching out to some of you guys here for some help on how to answer this. The survey is not different, but perhaps given new superintendent, new leadership, new initiatives, I'm assuming that some of our answers will change on this. 
but just as a heads up that I'm, I'll more likely be reaching out to you guys uh, for, for help on completing this uh, requirement. And if you want um, to read a little bit more about it, go ahead and click on the TA announcement. Um, and so that's pretty straightforward. The other thing that is a requirement is to report a um, annual report to the school board each year over the SHAC and the summaries of what happened during the school year with SHAC and some of the things that were discussed, the initiatives, anything else that came out of that year's um, meetings. So that's going to be something that gets worked on in the next couple months. Um, and we're kind of hoping to be able to provide that report to the school board um, no later than August of this year. I have a quick question. It yeah. sounds like I'm going to go way back. But um, I remember when we were talking first about, I guess it was last year, about the sex ed programs and mm -hmm. stuff. Did we finalize like what we were? No, we, even close. we didn't get inform we didn't get it I don't think another no. presentation on that. No. And for this year because no one because here's how it's supposed to work. That's gotta be something that's initiated and then, goes and then it goes through SHAC as we then take whatever's being recommended or requested. We then as a SHAC meet to discuss the request we review curriculum based on the request, and then we make a decision. And then that decision goes to the school board for their review and final approval. But because nothing was requested or brought to the SHAC's uh, attention this year, we're not gonna go out of a way to do that because again, there has to be like a need that we'll discuss and meet if there is one, but this year no one brought it up which I thought was a little interesting. Well, the health um, requirement changed, right? I think the health class as changed. As far as cheeks that require yeah, the cheeks are changed. So I think that's why nobody requested it. Because before we were, we were, everybody was taking it. So yeah, I that's, I hadn't thought about that. Before. Okay, that does make sense. So that's why nobody's bringing it up because the, the requirements have changed. And I will say that those who have gone through the SHAC process to approve health and sex ed curriculum, um, it's districts that are few and far between. <clears throat> Not many have, and the ones that I have seen do it are the bigger districts, the six A's. Well, in the one we looked at, we decided that wasn't for us, so right. and that's what there's no movement. And that's what ends up happening is that currently, because there are so few TA-approved curriculums for that, um, there's very little to look at. And so when we have looked at what's available, there's, it's been very difficult to achieve consensus yeah. because everybody's got kind of their one or two, um, I guess, areas of concern and no curriculum is perfect. Therefore, someone's got an issue or a concern with this part, someone's got an issue with this. And so it's just never been able to bring everybody together to agree on of, of what you do and do not like, can we agree on this, even though there are things that you do not like? Haven't been able to do yeah. that at all. Okay. When multiple parents were here, it was pretty much a hard abstinence only yeah, from the parents. Yeah, it was like, nope. <laughs> and that's what I remember being told, too, was that it was pretty much abstinence only, which, you know. We all know from our high school days how well that worked. <laughs> well, that's just kind of where Texas, I feel like, has been stuck with for the last, I don't know, 30 years. Because, yeah, because, I mean, I don't know anybody knows any of the other policies that govern the other states, but the majority of them have moved way beyond abstinence-only education. Yeah. Well. I know. I'd rather get your head in the sand and pretend like it's not existing. Texas kind of does its own thing, as we all know. <laughs> like, find what teen pregnancy rates are with different states. That don't you know none of the kids in our school well, district are pregnant? Yeah. Pretty much close to the last. How many immaculate conceptions we have in teens versus? <laughs> yeah. See, I haven't poured over the data to really know, but I would assume that those states that have a like a <clears throat> wide scope of curriculum that focuses on you know just the whole from beginning to end on how to handle all that, that their pregnancy rates at the teenage level are lower. lower. Then they would be yeah. if we're only doing abstinence only, knowing that more than likely our kids are active, they yeah. are participating, but we're not giving them the tools to 
really handle that in, in the way that, you know, an adult probably would. It's not abstinence. It's just that the disease, uh, you know, the consequences of being pregnant is just the disease that you can get. And it can be lasting effect for a child, you know, for, for a person, for anybody get a disease that you can they're getting educated on it. It's just whether it's a good education or not. Well, yeah, that just brings me back to when I was in high school. I'm like, yep, nothing's changed. <laughs> so the report um, does have some requirements that um, must be included in the report. I just want to include this here so that everybody's aware that we don't just get to report to the board things like of the requirements that we do have to meet. If there's anything else that you guys want to make sure is included in that report, please let me know. But what I and what I intend to do is to obviously meet these standards. But then I'll go back through this slide deck, capture the hearts, the heart, and like the meat of what we've done this year, and make that part of the report. We've talked about the application. Like I said, it opens up on May 1st, and then we did the bylaws. We're going to add public forum. And we're going to make that known so that everybody's aware of the opportunity to come at the beginning to speak about topics that are related to Shack. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about before we end today's meeting is that we're going to offer, and by offer, we're going to give a student engagement survey in the next week or so to all students grades 3 through 12. Okay. Um, I don't know how much we survey here, but to me, it's a great opportunity for us to collect feedback, particularly from our students who I feel if they were given this, I hope that they would answer truthfully. Um, you know, we can always go through the data and I'm sure there'll be some outliers, but I've always had success in uh, my prior experiences with surveys, with feedback, whether it was parents or students. So this year we're gonna do that. This also helps us keep our compliance with the bullying standards because <clears throat> will there be any surveys for teachers as well? I have one ready. Okay. Because we, I've, I've had it ready for a while. We went through a third party company, and I'm, I mentioned one time, and they're like, "Do we really want to know?" Um, so, <laughs> and I'm the third party company because <laughs> All right. I, I don't charge anything. No, oh, you're building. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm free of charge on the work nice. that I'm putting in on that. Um, but I'm also using legitimate vendor surveys where I'm just taking what they have done and mm -hmm. flipping it into a Google survey where if I ask them to do that same survey for us, they charge five, ten thousand dollars minimum, yeah, and then probably an additional five or ten thousand to analyze the data and provide yeah. you a report. Well, Google does that for me for free for too, free. so yeah. that's how we're gonna handle it in the time being. The uh, other big thing that's coming from the new bullying standards is the need to offer a survey. Here it is. Using an age-appropriate survey that includes relevant questions on bullying, cyberbullying, and so forth. I'll say this. When I've been audited by TA this year over how we've handled specific uh, incidents of bullying, good thing we've got that protocol in place because that's where they start. They want to see your protocol. We've got our handbook. We follow the six steps analysis from Walsh Gallegos. We have all of our forms. We're solid there. Next thing is, did you give a survey? Well, did we give a survey? Have we ever no. done one? No. I wasn't, I don't think we have. And so that was one thing that was provided feedback to me from TA was, you need to have a survey. And it's a bully specific survey? Like it's just about bullying? And that's the thing. Or it doesn't it need to be specifically about that. It just needs, your survey needs to be age appropriate and has to have relevant questions on those topics. So when this student engagement survey will come out, it's going to capture that part, but also a lot of other things too, so that it's not just focusing on that one topic, but going to give us a kind of a whole picture from the student standpoint, just about their level of engagement on, on, school in the district and anything else that we may want to know about their experience. So where are we serving mental health services in our survey? 
Well, let me get back. And again, I created this survey based on another survey from School Perceptions, mm -hmm. which is one of those survey companies. Um, and to kind of get back to the teacher survey, the reason why that hasn't come out yet is because we're looking to do a bond survey that's going to ask very similar questions to teachers on that as well. And so I'm kind of wanting the bond survey to kind of happen first and then that to be second. But I, I need to check back on when we're actually going to do that bond survey because I was kind of under the impression that already would have happened. So let me get back on that one. But yes, I do have the faculty one ready to go. You're an incredibly organized individual, by the way. As you have to be. I, I admire that about Thanks. you. Like the things that you go through in the, the format, I'm like, oh. You have to be. That's, I, got, I got way too many things happening in my world where if I'm not, you want to talk about not being prepared? Yeah, it'd be like the definition of not being prepared. Um, but I appreciate that. The survey is going to just ask some very generic questions at the front, just about like grades and you know attendance and how long you've been in school and so forth. Um, this section here is reflections. Let me see if I can actually get a preview. Oh my God, I blocked myself out. Okay, hold on. Accepting responses. But I just turned it on. Oh, accepting responses, okay. Still not, okay, next. Next section, okay. No oh, questions, the questions are required. Oh my God. <laughs> this is why I, uh, maybe I should pay somebody to do a survey. <laughs> okay, let's do it this way instead. So the question was, what are the Sorry. actual things being asked? This section is reflections, and I know that's a little small on the screen there. Mm -hmm. So this one is more about just like how students feel about certain things. And again, as we've done surveys before, these are kind of just very standardized questions about how I feel, what's going on, and so forth, right? Are you yay, nay, no? I just want to ask more questions. <laughs> I also don't want to have survey fatigue either, though, because that's a, that's a legitimate right, thing. Right, but I'm thinking grant. Wise, if you have questions because there's a need for send more, them send those to me. We can, yeah. Can you send those to me, please? Because that's kind of another probably just thing. use the GAD, you know, we talked about the GAD 7 and the PHQ. I think using some of those questions, like some of the very basic questions, would help us. You could even probably copy and paste those questions. I will. Can you yeah. send me which ones you want me to include in here? I'll, I'll stick them in here. Cool. So this one's really just about asking students to reflect on their experience. And there's a whole bunch of different things happening here with the social and emotional aspect that. Hopefully we can learn a little bit more about what they answer and what we can do differently for, for that. Wellness is the next section, and this really kind of speaks more to the SHAC uh, aspects of school nutrition um, and just student health. And so not necessarily like, I know this really in the prioritizing of everything we need to know about our kids, this tends to always kind of fall towards the bottom because usually it's academics, behavior, attendance, and so forth. But I do feel based on COVID and just based on just the need to have this information, um, that's why it's being included. And this will be data that we analyze in SHAC for next year. And it's important, everybody who is, if the kid hasn't eat at home, if he doesn't eat at home, he's not going to feel like paying attention or be in a bad mood or hungry. Exactly. Upset. So that's how we'll start yeah. analyzing the data. Say, yeah, it's good to know this. Is this something that's still a, a post-COVID issue? Yeah. Is this more of a systemic family issue? Do we, do we realize that we've got 15% of our population that doesn't eat breakfast every yes. day? And mm -hmm. is there something really there that maybe we need to either communicate or promote breakfast mm -hmm. so that everyone's aware that there is an opportunity. You can come here and get it. Here are your choices and so forth. Will we be able to target specific students with the information? Like if I find out something through this survey that I have a student that has previously not helped yeah. in whatever yeah. circumstance. We'll That's be the only thing I worry about this is that you're going to wind up with more kids who are going to have to target with like the emergency of mental health needs. 
So well, that's where we'd have to. Like, well, that's the thing. We already know we've yeah. got a crisis on our hands when yeah. it comes yeah. to just all of our students more than likely having some sort of issue. This will just provide greater insight yeah. into that. And if there, we learn that one student in particular answers a certain way, and we really need to kind of get on top of that. This just gives us that opportunity to do that, because more than likely you're not hearing from that student or no one's picking up anything from the student, but they took the survey. So almost like our obligation to follow up to see what's really going on. Because they took it seriously too, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the next one is about my school. And this one really has to do with uh, relationships and just the need for students to have someone or that they know that They've got people on their campus that do care about them, that they can trust, that they can go to in a time of need. Um, talks about classmates, too. Again, about the adults. And then also ask them a couple questions about just their levels of satisfaction at school. Are they pleased with, I guess, the quality service that they're receiving? Um, and just, you know, uh, questions along those lines. And then the last section is about learning. This is the academic piece. And so, do I set goals? Do my classes challenge me? Am I putting forth my best effort? My teachers, do they give me extra help? My parents, do they have expectations for me to do well? And so forth. And so, hopefully with the way this is set up, based on the sections and based on the way the questions are asked, this will kind of hopefully give us a better and more complete profile of where our students are at just from a social and emotional standpoint. And then we can take that data, we can go from there and see what we can do with it. And also keep us in compliance on things that we need to be in compliance on. It's a great tool. I mean, it gives us a jumping off point exactly. for how we can better serve our kids. And just wanting parents to know too that we value the feedback we value students' feedback. We're going to prioritize it. We're going to give them the opportunity. We're also going to give them that opportunity, too, to fill out a very similar survey that will ask questions that are similar but from their perspective. So this survey mirrors kind of like the faculty edition, which will also mirror a parent edition. And so that's going to kind of work where we do the student one first, was wanting to do the faculty one second, and then the parent one last. So that's going to be stuff that comes to see if those, like ideally, those numbers would match, uh, match you, up. You would think. Parents, but um, they're going to be way off, I'm sure. Be kind of curious yeah. to see just yeah. how, how close or how, I guess, just are far apart they are, right? Interesting. So heads up on this. This will be coming next week. You'll get an email. Um, because each campus is so different with their schedules, um, I will kind of leave it up to the counselors or the administration on the campus to determine how to distribute that survey. Because what I'll do is I'll email the administrators and the counselors about this, and then you all go forth with that survey and issue it out as you best see fit. And that's pretty much the meeting. Um, like I said, try to get us out of here in an hour or so. If anybody has anything else to talk about, to want to cover, please let me know. But that's pretty much it for today and for the year.